a collection of Stuart engines and some other nice things. This one's part 13. Trimming the studs to the same length on the cylinder and steam chest cover, the final assembly of the engine and test runs using compressed air. The studs are all over the place on this engine and I don't really know why. I'm going to start by removing any long studs then refitting them the other way around because as you can see in this clip the threads at each end of the studs are not the same length. Once fitted the stud is now more or less the correct length. The only problem with these studs is that on the end of them is a small pip where they've been machined. Very carefully and I repeat myself very carefully I'm using a grinder to clean up the top of the studs. It's important when doing this to keep full control of the Proxon motor tool and not let it get away from you. After cleaning up the tops of the studs that needed it, it was time for a bit of a clean up. First of all, using some WD-40 on my toothbrush, I'm cleaning up the top of the steam chest. Then I wiped over the area using an oily rag. Mounting a pair of steam engine sole plates on a piece of wood was never going to be a good idea. But something's gone wrong here, the bolt's been cut short. The builder was unlucky enough to drill the hole for the bolt right where a pin went through from the veneer. And his solution was to shorten the bolt and just push it in the hole. As you've just seen, my solution was to drill a 5 seconds of an inch diameter hole deeper into the wood. And I applied some pressure where I could feel the pin. Then I threaded the hole using a 2BA die and now I have a nicely threaded hole that goes way down into the wood. As I'm tightening the bolt, you can see that it's pulling the sole plate down onto the wooden base. The next job is to change the massively overscaled 2BA bolts that hold the main bearings to the sole plate. I'm replacing them with a 2BA bolt with a one size smaller head, which is 3BA. Over many years, I have evolved different methods for doing different parts of the job. I'm about to fix the first main bearing to the sole plate using the smaller head 2BA bolts. Please note, at this stage of the assembly, I am not fully tightening the bearing blocks down onto the sole plate. When the assembly is fully complete, I will initially commence the running in process with the bearing blocks slightly loose, as that way they will find their own position and after a while the bearing block bolts will then be tightened to hold them in their final position. I'm not saying that you have to do it this way, this is just my preferred method for reassembling miniature steam engines that have new parts fitted. I've fitted these oil cups but I've really gone off them, mainly because my friend from whom I used to buy them never returns my calls. This image is only here as a good recommendation. Move parts like the connecting rods and the eccentric rods out of the way so you don't damage them when you fit the bearing blocks. Time for a final check of the tightness of all the bolts that go down into the wood. And the good news is, now they are all tight and they are all holding the sole plate to the wood. In this clip I'm mounting the other bearing block and as you can see, the bolt is not fully tightened and there is some movement on the bearing block. Here you can see how much movement there is. The clearance size of the holes in the bearing blocks are sufficient to allow a small amount of movement so you can align the parts properly. You've just seen me tighten the grub screw at one side of the flywheel to hold it to the crankshaft. I've already tightened the one at this side. Now it's time to set the valve timing. The question is which way do I want the flywheel to revolve? Normally I set horizontal engine flywheels without reversing gear, so that they rotate in a clockwise direction. This is the original crank web, and normally on steam engines of this type, the crank webs are just left in plain cast iron or steel. I'm going to do that, so with the help of a small amount of cellulose thinners, a wire brush, a grinder, and even more wire brushing, I reshape the entire piece. I need it to look like the one that I made that's fitted to the other side. And slowly but surely, finishing it off with a flapper wheel, I'm now getting there. I do like the effect of painted cast iron, but not in this area. The next part of the operation is a good idea if you're not quite sure what you're doing. I'm going to use some Loctite 603 
to fix this crank web onto the crankshaft like I did with the other one. You may be wondering why I want to do it this way. Well, it's quite simple, really. I'm going to use my calibrated eye to set the cranks at 90 degrees to each other. Even though perhaps I should make a jig for this, I think it will be fine using my eye. Once I'd applied the Loctite 603 to the crankshaft and to the crank web, I left the parts overnight to allow plenty of time for the Loctite to cure. Why did I change my mind and just use Loctite instead of a pin? Sometimes in life you have to live dangerously. Besides which, by using the Loctite principle, means that I don't have to commit myself to drilling a hole through the crank web and crankshaft and fitting a taper pin at this stage. Time will tell as to whether this is successful or not. Here I'm fitting the crank pins. The crank pins are held in place to the crank webs using a single 2BA bolt and this needs to be tight, but not so tight as to shear it off. The time has come to fit the cylinder end covers and I'm actually using a small screwdriver I've had for years and I got this out of a Christmas cracker. However, to fully tighten the two countersunk bolts I'm using a much larger screwdriver. For fitting the bracket that holds the cylinder I'm going to use the large headed 2BA bolts because in this application of holding the bracket in place they look quite good. The cylinder cover studs are slightly better than the ones on the steam chest cover and as you can see from this clip I took the time to get them all the right length. I find that you have good days and bad days doing this sort of a job. Having had plenty of experience doing this sort of thing I've set the timing of the engine in approximately the correct position. I've pumped some oil into the inlet pipe and here I'm oiling every moving part of the engine and I'm using quite a lot of oil. Time to connect the airline and see what happens. Believe it or not I got the valve timing more or less right straight away. It's not 100% and besides, usually, I make it so that stationary engines revolve in this direction, clockwise. If you're building a model steam locomotive, that needs to go in forward and reverse, but a mill engine doesn't need to go in reverse. The engine seemed to like running better the other way. Getting it to run smoothly in this clockwise direction took quite a bit of tweaking of the eccentric sheaves. Even now it's perfect. I did of course go into OCD mode with this, but I'm not going to show it on the video. It's time for me to go, I'll leave the engine running until the end of the video. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.
please take the time to visit my Mainstream Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.